questions or yeah i mean just just to give everyone everyone a background so jaron is uh one of my heroes he's the origin of the ideas in the data's labor chapter he i've learned more in fact about uh, many things other than economics than about economics from him, but I've also learned profoundly about economics. And uh, we're really lucky that he's in Berkeley and was willing to come over here and spend some time with us. Uh, we've been wanting for a while to have a chat about some of these ideas in a public setting, and we thought this was a perfect opportunity, so I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, cool. I, um, I, I'm, the world is so... Um uh, it's made of so many insularities these days. So I guess I really there isn't much contact between your community and my world. Uh, so it's funny. If you're curious about my stuff after this talk, there's a, a book I wrote before blockchain called Who Owns the Future that addresses this issue of how to create decentralized technology. Before Ethereum, not before blockchain. Well, it was before blockchain was. It's uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. The original paper was, I, I guess, 2008. Yeah. 2008. Yeah. Uh, Oh, that's right. No, no, no. I'm thinking of Gadget. I wrote Gadget before oh, before right. blockchain. Right. Yeah, there's another book called You're Not a Gadget. That's that. But who, anyway, who owns the future? Is one of that, the best economics anyway, books of the decade. Anyway, uh, whatever. So okay, so really um, there's so much to say about this. Um, I think. Um, wow. There are. Can I can I express to you my three concerns? Yeah, please. About both. Um, some of your radical markets ideas and what I what I take as a general tenor of the blockchain community. Yeah. Um, okay. The first one has to do with how soon which aspect of the vision can be realized. All right. And so it goes like this. Um, as we all know, there's been a kind of a revolution in economics in recent decades that people realize that economics was made of humans and humans have emotions and are not necessarily as predictable on the original terms of economics theory. Yeah. And so, um, and we've entered into a world now where everybody's communications are mediated by these giant platforms like Facebook that are financed solely by others who wish to manipulate those people. Yeah. So we're in a world of scientific manipulation of human behavior and perception that's unprecedented. And so the problem is um, if, the syst if the solution assumes rational individual actors, but the manipulation machine isn't shut down before the system comes in place, how can these uh, computational decentralizations like work? Or, or another, another way, how do you make sure that you shut down the manipulation engine before you institute other decentralization architectures? I think that's a great question and not one I've heard, but... Um <laughs> But uh, you asked me to be here, you know, uh, like you're, yeah. you're uh, like I, so what I, <laughs> tough what I, luck. What I, um, <laughs> what I think is, uh, I think my view about the sequencing uh -huh. aligns quite closely with your, uh, I think your uh, question, which is that, so first of all, I don't believe in sequencing in a simple sense because I actually think we need to have multiple things going on at the same time at different levels of abstraction. So I want to see something like data as labor and the antitrust reforms, which I think would help address some of the manipulation issues that you're describing, implemented on a quite large scale quite quickly. Uh, I think that they're ripe for that, and, and I've really enjoyed writing together about some of those things. Um, on the other hand, the other ideas, I really am interested in seeing experimentation and art around them and people within the blockchain space sort of playing with and seeing whether there can be successes, at least with limited sets of people with them, and how they develop. Um, but I wouldn't want them very soon to be implemented on a large scale. Uh, some examples of things I think are promising and unpromising in that space are, I think it's promising to use it for spectrum. I think it's promising to use it within a virtual world for like uh, locations, for people who are like kind of nerdy and hanging out in the virtual world and playing with it. I think it would not be a good idea to use it for homes or for personal property in the near term. Um, but on the other hand, data is labor and the antitrust ideas are things I'd really love to see people running on in the 2020 election. Uh, and I think probably they will actually. Uh, and, and in Europe, uh, there's already significant uh, movement on yeah, all of those true. things. So um, I wanna see lots of things bloom, but in different 
amounts and different types depending on the idea and, and eventually achieving the sequencing, I think, very much like what you were saying, which is address the large concentrations of capital and power right now and manipulation and psychological power and so forth, and then start to build in some of these longer term, more sustaining, uh, 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 liberating protocols uh, over time. Okay, cool. Now, just I'm just curious, when we say data is labor, how many people here know what that means? So sort of a minority. Um, would you mind if I took a moment to Maybe present the language, the language translator example? There's one example I use to try to get this idea across that I have found to be a good gateway uh, story. So I'm going to present you with this little tale. It's a true story. Um, so uh, back when I was um, your age, I guess, <laughs> uh, and I was a young computer scientist in the 70s and 80s, um, I, uh, uh, one of my mentors, Marvin Minsky, who did most of the storytelling that initiated the, what we call artificial intelligence, uh, he assigned some of the students a summer project of translating between languages, because it should be easy. You just have the grammar as a program, and then two dictionaries, and it should work, and it didn't. And then much, much later in the 90s, some, some uh, folks at IBM finally got it to work by using big data, where they had massive numbers of examples of phrase translations, and they could mash the results up and get a usable translation. So um, what's happened since then is a couple of online services, especially from Google and Microsoft, have uh, decimated the careers of people who are professional translators. The pattern has been very similar to what's happened to recording musicians, uh, investigative journalists, professional photographers, and so on, where a tiny minority figure out new niches where they do well. Most people just fall off into nothing, and overall there's only a tenth as many people making a living. So it's, it's been destructive. But the thing about it is you always hear these stories, well, it's, uh, it's like the buggy whip, the eternal buggy whip, uh, the creative destruction. Uh, the new technology has come along, and these people should find new lines of work because what they do is obsolete, except, except that every single day, both Google and Microsoft have to scrape tens of millions of phrase translations from people all over the world who do not know that their data is being taken. And it's absolutely essential because every single day there's new public events, new memes, new slang, new pop culture, and so you can't do translations without continuous scraping. So we're, we're lying to these people. In fact, they don't even know we're taking their data, so we're not even lying to them. We're not even wrong, if you know that reference. We're telling them, oh, you're obsolete. Oh, but we still need you. Okay, and, and, and since you're obsolete, maybe you'll survive on some basic income, but you're worthless. And so there's three problems with this, and it's important to keep all three of them in mind. One of them is the obvious one, that it's a lie, and lies are bad, right, mostly. Anyway, this one is certainly a bad lie. Two is it means we're not getting the best data we could get. If they knew that we needed their phrase translations, we could motivate them to give us better phrase translations. But that's like taboo. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't tell the person giving you the data because then they might get uppity and want something. So we have to steal from them without telling them, and then we have to figure out, oh my god, how do we trick these people into giving us better data? It's so stupid. If we just told them, they could give us better data, and then the language translation tools, which are great, would work better. That's the second problem. <laughs> But the third problem is that we're hiding the true economy. We're telling all these people, oh, you're doing women's work. This isn't real work. And so we're hiding the real economy just in order to concentrate it with a few tech companies. So doesn't this seem triply stupid, right? Okay, <laughs> it's a triple layer stupid thing. So uh, the way to fix it is to pay them and be honest. All right, and right now there's no mechanism. There's no way to even know their names. Like, it's really weird. Like, we have actually no way to really, we can find some of them if we put a lot of effort into it. If we wanted to pay them, there's no universal mechanism. There's not, it's, it's so fucking, like, I, someday historians are gonna look back and say, wow, what a bunch of morons. The, the first generation internet people were of whom I'm unfortunately one. So, um, if we could fix this, we would show the true size of the economy, we could be honest, and we could give people the dignity, the honest dignity of recognizing their new value in the new economy, which we're currently hiding from them. 
So that's what data as labor means. It means that as the society becomes more and more computational, instead of making people obsolete, what we're really doing is opening new channels of value between people, and the honest, dignified thing is just admit it, say so, it's good for everybody. All right, that's, that's data as labor. Was and, that clear? And, and, and by the way, I strongly... <laughs> <laughs> I, str I strongly recommend you guys read Jaron's book where this idea came from. Uh, you know, actually before, Jaron doesn't know this actually, but before I, um, I read that book, I used to write about what's called platform economics. And I was very much sort of sympathetic to mm -hmm. the standard vision of how these platforms work and so forth and tended to be a defender. And then I read Jaron's book and it really changed my whole perspective on these things and we started collaborating. So uh, I hope that you guys will uh, also, I mean, I think it's much easier sale for many people in the blockchain world that people should own the value of their data. But, uh, but it's something yeah, that was uh, eye-opening for me. I always feel awkward about self-promoting, but if you, the, book, the, the main book on this is gonna feel a little out of date to you because it is really from an early world, but it's called Who Owns the Future? But the very first one with this idea is a different book called You Are Not a Gadget, which is a little more fun and philosophical. And, and Jaron and I also have a piece that just came out in the Harvard Business Review called The Blueprint for a Better Digital Society. Oh, yeah, Society. yeah. Read the Harvard Business it's Review short. piece. It's, it's short. It's a really good, that's actually the best starting point, probably. Um, my publisher would hate, hate me for saying that. No, <laughs> tell them to buy And you're your being book. videotaped, Jaron. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, I want to bring up a totally different question. Please, yeah. All right. So. I've been around the digital world for a long time, yeah. and um, I've been at a lot of conferences where a new wave of younger people are filled with utopian idealism and energy, and I, I always love that feeling. Um, it doesn't get old. It's wonderful to, yeah. to see all of you. Um, I know some of you are thinking, wait, I'm not that young. So I, when I turned 40, it was the turn of the century, and I was at Stanford giving a talk at the CS department, and this freshman came up to me and looked at me, Jaron Lanier, you're still alive? <laughs> and that was, that was 18 years ago, so I don't know, but Somehow anyway. <laughs> what? Somehow you're still kicking. Somehow, yeah. Okay, but, but here's, here's, the, um, here's the question I want to ask. I have seen many cases where people have said, here's this digital design or this digital architecture that will solve this problem. It's perfect. It's mathematically perfect. It's crypto perfect. We can prove it. We have theorems. And then you deploy it in the real world, and the problem is at the edge of it, where you touch the reality, isn't perfect because it never is. And then everything fails because people rely too much on it. Yeah. So uh, here's an example. The State Department was like, we have this encrypted communication scheme. Oh, well, then just all takes is one or two leakers and forget your, you know, <laughs> everything's open. Um, there have been so many examples of that. And I, the question I have. It's kind of like this question of, is it better to be resilient and bend before you break, or is it better to try to be perfect? Is there something just intrinsic to making these perfect systems, like the, like, uh, the distributed uh, ledgers that the blockchain community works on? Is there something about this that lulls us into a false security? Like, for instance, I'm thinking of the, the Bitcoin exchanges where everybody loses their money and everything falls apart. Um, or all, all this sort of like is is the do we does it do we let our guards down at the edge of well, our of the I, algorithm? I think I'd actually go further than what you uh -huh. said, which is that I think that optimization almost always breeds fragility, and this is not just true in this economic sphere. It's true in machine learning. So there's this idea of overfitting. If you allow a lot of degrees of freedom and you have a small number of data points and you fit them as well as you can, you're going to get something that breaks. Sure. So um, uh, it's actually interesting because the genesis of the ideas in this book are, on the one hand, William Vickery's ideas. But if you look at Vickery's original 1961 paper, he basically says in a series of footnotes, well, actually, this stuff is completely implausible and impractical because here's all the ways that it's going to break. And um, interestingly, the economics community for the last 30, 40 years basically just went on elaborating ever more optimal and complex versions of those underlying Vickery ideas, and then saying, well, but these are completely useless because they're all going to break, so forget about that. W what we tried to do in this thing, and in fact, Vitalik Buterin and I are writing an article of the same name, is called uh, Taking Vickery Seriously, Not Literally. So what we tried to do is to say, no, there, there is this transformative vision. The 
literally optimal thing is just not plausible at all for some of the reasons that you're talking about. Is there some approximation thereof that can get a lot of the value associated with it, but that's robust along like 30 other dimensions that we might be interested in? And that was the genesis of the ideas in the book. There's this underlying mechanism called the Vickery clark groves mechanism, which is the optimal mechanism. And everything in the book is an approximation to that mechanism, often taken formally, sometimes more informally, um, that we then try to make fit with different philosophical systems, deal with different sociologies, different with different psychological situations, et cetera, and yet retain some simplicity, because if you let it be too complex, that's another way that things break. Sure. So um, that doesn't mean that this stuff's gonna work. I, I'm almost sure that things are gonna change in the field. And in fact, the whole reason we have an ideas and research track within the conference is that we don't think it's set in stone and that it's exactly right and so forth. We want the ideas to evolve. And in fact, the ideas are evolving. I put out a paper with Vitalik and Zoe that is related to, but quite a bit of an elaboration upon this and actually evolved in sort of joint thinking with the piece that Jaron and I wrote together that we were referring to earlier. So uh, I agree with everything that you said and I think it's part of, it's, it's central to the philosophy behind the book. But is Vitalik here? He's not right now. No, okay. No. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, he was here this morning. I think he had to run. Okay, cool. Um, there's a topic that comes up a lot yeah. around blockchain, which is the carbon footprint of it. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I'll tell you, for myself, I'm the way I've approached this problem is I've said, how much how much energy are we wasting to support the manipulation economy in order to not people versus to not pay people versus how much we'd spend to actually keep track of how to pay people right. and when i look at that balance i don't think blockchain looks so bad yeah all right cuz right now we're basically spending almost all of the carbon footprint of the internet on total bullshit <laughs> uh, there's barely any it's like this, there's, there's like a little tiny bit of real matter and the rest is dark matter and dark energy. It's like just this weird like manipulation stew that doesn't mean anything and fake people and all that stuff. So, um, but I, I still think it's um, one of the most moral and eth morally and ethically crucial questions about the future architecture for civilization is will it, will it fry the planet or not? And if we look at the curves of where it's going, we just have to talk about it. And I've, I've talked jokingly about sending little tiny satellites up to create self-assembling server farms on the moon or something to do it. And maybe some solution like that could actually work. But what, what do you, have you thought about this issue? The, 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 um, what, what should the carbon tax be on the computation needed yeah. to run a civilization? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, within the blockchain in particular, I think an important source of that heavy carbon footprint is the fact that we have permissionless anonymous systems that invite a lot of excess redundancy mm -hmm. and- Well, that's the whole and, point anyway, in a way. You know, yeah. yeah, but the thing is that if we had more identity-based systems, which are potentially, th there's a lot of interesting work on distributed identity going on. If we can make systems like that work without centralizing a lot of power to make them work, it's possible that we can avoid a lot of those downsides associated with the blockchain. But more broadly, uh, of this issue, not just of dealing with carbon from the blockchain, but carbon uh, in a broader civilizational way, I mean, I think the crucial thing we need for that is good collective decision-making protocols, because basically, our, especially at the international level, our collective decision-making protocols are like completely broken. It's like you've got five countries that can veto anything, and then no one listens to the UN anyways, and. I mean, so it's really a total mess, and, and there's nothing that anyone really views as particularly legitimate either. So the hope is through some of the experimentation with these things, we can arrive at more legitimate, grounded, thoughtful, collective decision-making protocols that can hopefully help us square some of these issues. But I don't have anything that much yeah. stronger than that. I say. have to say, one, the, the greatest tragedy of the internet is this mistake we, we made, and I, I was part of it to say, well, look, this should all be uh, we should just let corporations figure this out. And there was no democratic layer built in, no identity layer built in, no uh, payment layer built in, no data storage layer built in. We just get, we, we just put out this raw thing. And I remember these conversations back then saying we're, we're making these gifts of hundreds of billions of dollars to persons unknown. Yeah. 
Uh, and somehow it just seemed like that was the way to be libertarian and American and all that. Well, and, the, the, uh, the fundamental problem with these yeah. systems, and the blockchain makes this even more explicit, is they formalize private property, but they don't formalize democratic governance. And if you formalize private property and you don't formalize democratic governance, you get the rule of the people who control the servers and the people who control the, the yeah. you know, the, so, and, that, and that's what we're getting in the blockchain space right now. Um, maybe we should talk a bit about MIDS. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so uh, Glenn and I uh, have this paper called, what's it called, a Blueprint for a Better Digital Society, is that yeah, it? Yeah, so we had our own and title for it, but, uh, but of course that's not how the, yeah, the journalism the process journal, works. The journal gets to rename <laughs> it, which is fine. I, I don't even remember what our title I is. I like so. the color blue. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a, the you can we can it's easy to find Harvard Business Review, and the basic notion is that in order for any of this to work, there has to be more than just a central abstract architecture and a bunch of individuals. The individuals have to be able to form into medium-sized groups uh, that have integrity and solve certain kinds of problems, and we call these MIDs for uh, mediators of individual data. Um, and let me, can I give one example of why a MID that. is important and yeah. then you can give another? Yeah. Um, let me give you one example of why MID's important. Um, there's a natural network effect that makes certain kinds of platforms near universal. So like it's hard to start a new Facebook. Lots of people are trying and it's hard to get everybody coordinated to move over to a new one at once, right? So it becomes a natural persistent network effect based monopoly, even leaving aside the hypnotic mind control bullshit and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and addiction and all that, even aside from that. Uh, and the same thing happens with search platforms platforms and many other platforms. And so um, uh, then what happens is horrible people use these platforms to amplify themselves. So you ha if you have some horrible racist asshole on, can I speak, I can use language here, right? Yeah. <laughs> I never know. Anyway, you have some horrible racist asshole and they, they, they amplify themselves on Twitter and Facebook, they learn how to game the algorithms, they get more and more amplified because they excite people's attention because people get so pissed off at them, but that actually drives engagement, which is what the algorithms are pushing for, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then we all say, oh, please Facebook, please Mr. Zook, will you regulate our speech and ban those people? Oh, will you ban the bullies? Will you ban the fakers? Will you ban the sadistic people? Will you ban the blah, 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 blah? And we end up petitioning these giant international corporations to, to become the, the, you know, the overlords of our connections with each other, which is just bizarre. So every time we win, we lose, right? And, 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 and this has got to be the wrong way to do things. You can't run a society this way. It just, I just, it seems terrible. So what we're proposing is that um, there, the thing that existed in society before that solved this problem was the idea of institutions that weren't the government, weren't universal, but could gain their own branding and respect. So if you have a really good science journal, people trust that at least most of the time they'll do their best to only publish research that's well vetted and, and, and juried. If somebody has a news site that is branded, people trust that over time they've earned their way to a reputation. It's a way for reputation to accrue that isn't universal because there's no such thing as global optimization. This is a mathematical idea, but you can't, there's no such thing as life forms that evolve without species. You need to be able to have some separation. There's no global optimization. You can't find it. All you can do is locally optimize. And so these things locally optimize, um, examples are everything from sports teams to um, uh, labor unions. Labor unions are a great example, but maybe also partnerships, like a law partnership is another example. And so what we're proposing is that when Facebook talked about moving fast and breaking things, the, thing they, the things they broke were all these in-between structures in the society. They tried to centralize. And so to decentralize, you can't just have a diffuse sea of individuals. This, the individuals have to form into these intermediate sized structures, which are the cellular structure of a society. Or just to, I can be geeky here. You can't make a functioning neural network without intermediate layers, right? It can't accumulate the state that is its whole purpose. And these become those intermediate layers for an overall civilization. And so if you have nothing but the central architecture and then a bunch of individuals, you have a civilization without the intermediate layers and it can't learn. All right, so you need to have these things. Um, 
I love this audience. I yeah. can say these geeky things. <laughs> Usually people are like, ah, he said something geeky. Ah, it's math. Anyway. <laughs> and he, one of the unique things about this whole discussion is that it's been bringing together this kind of technical approach um, with uh, societal concerns. And that's actually kind of a new thing. And it's, I think it's very welcome and it's exactly what we need. So I appreciate being able to be both geeky and... Uh, anyway, so that's part of the idea of MIDS. Do you want to say anything else about MIDS? Well, so just, just uh, I t tend to like a little bit more historical, philosophical perspective Good. to pair with uh, the technical one. You know, this point that Jaron's making is uh, new to the digital world, but it's not new to the world at all. In fact, this is one of the oldest themes in people thinking about democracy. When Alexei de Tocqueville came to the United States, he said that what sustained American democracy was that there wasn't just the national government. There were local communities, there were voluntary organizations, and that the complex overlapping nature of all these organizations and the ways in which Americans participated in them were what sustained democratic pluralism and avoided the tyranny of the majority. Um, Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite philosophers, wrote about how the extreme capitalism of the late 19th and early 20th century had left the individual naked in the face of the state. People were atomized. They didn't have their communities around them. They didn't have, they had, all that had been swept away by the world of the radio and the world of uh, capitalism. And, and that that was what allowed for totalitarianism because there was nothing to protect the individuals against someone who seized the only locus for collective organization. And people need collective organization. So they said, please give us collective organization. Mm -hmm. Give us something to organize this chaos. And that just opened the door to Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin and so forth. So I think what the New Deal did, I think what the American Republic did is build up those institutions. And they do need to get broken. They shouldn't endure forever. And, and some of the breaking of those old institutions is right. We don't always need to have a bookstore you know, sitting on the corner. That's not the only way. But the fact that Amazon is the only one who recommends us books, that's a problem, right? Uh, we should have bookstores online that help us browse and search and uh, obtain their reputation. We don't always need to have someone on the street corner selling the newspapers, but we do need stores that curate that content. So uh, that, those roles of helping us manage our attention, of help managing the quality of the things we create, and ensuring that some economic power allows that to be quantified and allows people to receive a real token of the value and to live a decent life in that way, those are the things that, that we need, and we need these intermediate organizations to do it. So, MIDS, make sense? <laughs> <laughs> exactly how to start. Like, um, the very hardest problem with any of these things is if you have a, a good idea about how to improve the world, getting from here to there is magnitudes harder than just articulating a good destination. And there might be some wonderful destinations where there's no path from here to there, right? Where hypothetically, if you could get there, it'd be wonderful, but we don't have any way of doing it. So. Um, we all, you all, you have a lot of work cut out for you. But actually, that brings me to another really interesting yeah. topic to me. So I've lived through a, a number of crazy mad fads in Silicon Valley where people gather in conferences are like, just sure, this is going to change the world and save yeah. everything. And, and people make billions of dollars suddenly, and there's a ton of people jumping in, sure that they're going to make their fortune. Um, it's happened to virtual reality twice. Uh, once fairly recently, like five years ago, four or five years ago by now, um, but I've seen it. Uh, the dot com bubble was inc was really insane. Um, you'd come to to a conference in Moscone here, and it would just be filled with people who were like on fire. We are going to become billionaires, and um, so here's the interesting question about this. Um, there's some energy like that around blockchain. Let's just admit it, and <laughs> and. Um, there are those in the camp who say, there are two camps about this. One camp says, you know what, this might not be the most um, elegant or dignified way for the tech community to proceed, but it works. 
Like, sure, the dot-com thing was stupid, and there were a lot of ridiculous dot-coms back at the turn of the century. But on the other hand, we got the internet working, we got all this stuff building, and a few of them were good. Um, there are those who say, oh, OK, so a bunch of people put billions of dollars into VR things that aren't really happening. Um, so what? It's like moving forward. You should be happy. And of I am. It's great. Um, so there are those who say, this is just the way p people are passionate creatures, and this is what we need, and that we should just plan that the only way to do things is through hype cycles. Um, and then there are those who say, no, we've got to grow up. We can't afford this anymore. We're responsible for the planet's survival. We're destroying our climate. We're too powerful to behave like toddlers. We have to do better. So like, how do you feel about those two approaches? Well, I think that m my perspective is I I believe that only through some notion of what you might call a bubble do we ever get any collective organization. If you think about all power is in some level a bubble, you know, if people one day in Nazi Germany realized that actually Adolf Hitler was Charlie Chaplin and it had all been a gag, um, if that was made uh, common knowledge among the whole public, Hitler wouldn't have much authority uh, uh, so do you think from that if, point if, on. Do you think if a whole culture became aware that an authoritarian leader was actually a reality TV star, <laughs> that would have any impact on... No, no never mind. Never mind. It's a uh, hi pure hypothetical. But, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, on, on the, so I think there has to be something like that. On the other hand, what really worries me about the whole bubble thing is that in a capitalist society, it's not just structured as a way of uh, organizing people collectively, but as a way of legitimating a few people randomly getting ridiculously rich and a lot of other people randomly and ridic getting ridiculously ruined. And I don't think it has to be that way. I think there are other ways we can organize ourselves collectively, which will involve some bubble and some religion and some fake uh, belief in something that really doesn't matter that much because that's what all collective um, organization is about. But, you know, the United States is like that. But the United States didn't make George Washington king, right? So, so I think that there are ways that we can build collective myths, which we need, without, like, huge, this person gets rich, then this thing goes crashing. But you have to build it into the rules of the system. You can't have it all be based on speculation and just total sort of greed-based whatever. You have to have some more balance between aspects of building for your own success and some more social goal. So there's a hypothesis. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, no, it makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah. I want to get slightly mathy again. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So there's some times when we unite people in a network and they're trading value. And at the end of the day, they build a zip curve where only a tiny number benefit. Yeah. And there are other systems where they build a bell curve. And there's some kind of a big hump in the middle. And the que I think the most crucial question is, what gives you the bell curve? Because the bell curve is the secret to a decent, sustainable, democratic, distributed power society, right? And if you have no bell curve, but everybody's exactly the same, then some authoritarian system forces everybody to be the same. So that's also not good. The bell curve is your signal of both stability and freedom, in my view. So um, a lot of our systems have been creating zip curves. And it has to be said that a lot of the blockchain examples so far are very Ponzi-like and zipfy, right? We can all admit that? Worse than the rest of society, yes. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. All right. So um, surely building up more of an ability to trade between people in a network is key to creating the, this result. And another thing is, over, is, is some way of having what happens in the present moment not be overwhelmed by what happened before. Yeah. Some kind of a way that legacy doesn't rule everything, which is the way to overcome zipfiness and, yeah. and uh, ponziness, <laughs> if I can say those things. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to do that? Well, I mean, I think at some level, that's precisely the goal of the cost, the common ownership self-assessed tax, mm -hmm. which causes things to sort of, the past to sort of decay by 7% every year at some level. Right, so that gives sort of like a 14-year cycle of things renewing themselves, which actually isn't so far off of the biblical uh, uh, prescriptions. So, um, 
Oh, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, that, that's that's the point. That's the point. It's also two, two times the cell cycling in your body. It's also the cicadas. Uh, and the cicadas. Well, they, yeah. they would. Yeah, let, let's let's see how much numerology we could pull off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if, if we if we thought the nerdiness wasn't good enough, now we're going to go back to like you know old fashioned nerdiness. Yeah. You know? uh, okay. <laughs> but but yes, I mean that, that that that's that's the crucial idea there, and I completely agree with what you're saying. And I also think that sort of system can also disincentivize speculative motives. Because if you sort of know that stuff's gonna decay, then you know you have a lot more focus on, well, what can I actually get done, rather than how can I sort of like get on to something that's either gonna lead to wild success or possibly land me in the poorhouse, which is, I think, been a lot of the problems with this space. I've been trying to imagine what this world would be like yeah. if that was implemented. and. For me, I think the math works. Yeah. I think I believe the math of it. I'm not totally sure, yeah. but I'm starting to believe it. I'll tell you where I worry about it, and, and it goes like this. Um, in my, I've known, I've had the good fortune to know a lot of really brilliant um, people who contributed disproportionately to society, yeah. and probably some vast majority, I don't know, 95% yeah. or something had the quality where as they developed in their life, they nested somewhere. They had some special house. There, you know, there was uh, Richard Feynman's special little place in Pasadena or Oliver Sacks's cool little apartment in New York, et cetera. And they got to a place where they could define enough fixed points in their lives that, that thereafter they could create and, and, have, and have more freedom of variability because they weren't vagabonds. Now there are other people who are total vagabonds. And I'm thinking, of Paul, who knows who Paul Ar Erdos was? Okay, well he was this vagabond mathematician who had no... What's your Erdos number, John? Uh, two. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think mine's more like four or five. Uh, so that means how many degrees of freedom in, uh, or how many degrees separation. of separation uh, in, in uh, public co authorship? Yeah, yeah. In, in co authorship. Anyway, but Erdos had no home. He would just travel around. He'd just show up. And uh, in Palo Alto, he, you'd usually know he arrived because he'd be at the little Hunan restaurant on El Camino. And there he'd be. And like, oh, Paul's here. And then he'd, we're, uh, anyway. Um, but there are very few people like Erdos. Now, maybe in the future, the whole society will become more Erdo Erdosian. That's conceivable, but I'm Erdoshite. Er, what? Erdoshite. Erdo yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I think is, uh, I, I think this question of um, do we need to give people um, a, a, a way to reduce the variables in their lives uh, so that they can create their little cellular world of becoming more and more individual and concentrating on their stuff, and is there a way that making the world too economical makes it and, and right now, I think it is. I mean, it really breaks my heart when I see uh, like brilliant artist friends in Oakland being displaced because they can't afford the rent anymore due to gentrification. I think, oh God, there's something really dysfunctional about this. And yeah. and of course, in the city here, it's terrible. And um, uh, I uh, and it and it hurts all of us when we we're losing diversity. It's becoming an all nerd empire. Um, and I don't think that's healthy for us. So th the thing is, is there some way to build to p build in some kind of latch or ratchet system just to reduce the number of variables where people just don't even have to think about this? So th that, that yeah. kind of worries yeah. me. So, um, you know, there's a very important reason why the tax is 7% and not 100%, which is that it, it effectively would expropriate something like two thirds of private wealth, but it would leave one third of private wealth there. And you know, in Scandinavia, um, that's roughly the rates at which they are recycling social, you know, private wealth back to social wealth. And at, in the process of that recycling, what actually happens is not breaking down stability. What it actually does is it redistributes stability to the pe from the people who got it by hoarding it um, to everyone, so that they have a chance of affording it. Right now, as you pointed out. Most people in this country are renters, they're not owners. And most people who are owners are highly indebted. And most people who are highly indebted are at risk of losing their homes due to a little shock and mm -hmm, so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what you could afford in this system is not infinite stability because stability has a price. Stability has a price by the laws of nature. It's not, it's, I mean, it takes something to build a stronger house and it takes some, you know, to be sheltered in the cave and so forth. But the ability to afford that stability would be much more broadly shared rather than concentrated 
in the hands of a small number of people who are able to afford sort of arbitrary stability. R right now, the mean household in the United States has a million dollars of wealth, and the median household is $80,000 of wealth. So mm. um, w I, I, yeah. I, I don't support eliminating stability. I support allowing people to choose the amount of stability they want and forcing them to internalize the cost that that stability has on others when they exercise it in extremum, the same way that a carbon tax forces us to internalize when we just are completely lazy and just poop all over the environment, the cost that that creates for our planet and each other. Yeah. I got to tell you, this is one where uh, I still feel there might be some compromise on perfection needed to account for the ability of people to just kind of nest irrationally for periods. I don't know. I, f I kind of feel like I'd need that. I don't want to have to think about that every year. But that's a topic. Yeah. Yeah. That's a topic. Yeah. Um, We're what? running out of time. Oh. Oh, we are running out of time. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a, hand of a, a round of applause for Jaron and Glenn?